Welcome to the BNS on Aerospace and Defense podcast series. I'm Pat Hindle, Microwave Journal Media Director and Signal Integrity Journal. I'm joined by our host, Brian Goldstein, President Analog Devices Federal and Vice President Aerospace and Defense Group at Analog Devices. And substituting for Sean Darcy this time is Carl Higgins, Senior Director of Aerospace and Defense Segment Marketing at Analog Devices. And we have a special guest with us today, Sam Elacod. He is the general manager of RF and EW Systems at Anderil. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Pat. Pat. So uh, there's kind of an evolving trend that we're seeing in defense systems, and that's uh, software-defined radios, software-defined systems. And we really see Anderil as leading the way in this charge. So we want to talk about how this area is changing the industry and the way defense systems are designed. And so I thought, Brian, maybe you can uh, kick off the discussion for us. Yeah, no, thanks, Pat. And Sam, thank you for joining us. You know, uh, Carl and I have been doing a, a lot of discussion lately about the, uh, you know, about the world of these new types of companies like Andro, which we, we're calling disruptors. I think that's a pretty common term now. And, um, and we're really interested to, to hear your perspective today. And so could you could tell us a little bit about the history of Andro and, and how long you folks have been around and your charter and such? Absolutely. Thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, so Andro was founded in 2017 as a, a new defense startup. Our goal as a defense technology company is to transform the U.S. and allied military capabilities with advanced technology. So we have three core principles. First, Software is at the core of everything that we do. So the amount of sensors and systems deployed with our military is increasing, while at the same time, the amount of humans to operate those systems is decreasing. So we're trying to change the paradigm from building really big, massive systems into building lots of small, autonomous and affordable systems that at the core have, um, have software and artificial intelligence. What this allows us to do is gain an asymmetric advantage with affordable mass. So our goal is to use COTS technologies, uh, such as like what ADI offers, to quickly develop and put together and integrate hardware and then add in software solutions that also include artificial intelligence in order to give our customers a fast way and to iterate and to implement their uh, their conops and solutions. The thing that we we do is uh, we invest into our manufacturing process. So Andrel Andrel's efficiency in production starts with our good software and our system design architectures. Uh, systems are designed with our product teams uh, who are integrated who build things based on modular designs and then integrate them all together and use them kind of like as Lego blocks to build a lot of different systems um, and with a lot of reuse. Uh, and then our the final thing that Andrew brings to the table is a new business approach, which is really critical to moving quickly. So we use privately funded research and development dollars to build mission systems not to just specifications from the DOD or our customers. So we use private capital to take on the costs of R&D before we sell to the US government. We try to understand their problems and their operational needs and design their products to solve that mission. That means that we take on the risk, not the government. The result is that we're able to iterate and innovate far faster than the legacy approach in the traditional government contract timelines, and we end up saving the government and the taxpayer money. You said a whole bunch of really super cool things, and that's what we want to spend some time digging into um, because uh, your strategy is super interesting. So let me let me start with the first thing that's always important on these defense things is around, uh, especially now, is around this time to market. And so how are you thinking about time to market and how does, how does your strategy uh, really speed, speed these things along now? That's a great question, Brian. So one of the things that speed up our delivery times is our business model. We're 
uh, basically shifting the way that things are historically done in defense. As I mentioned before, we use our private capital to do the R&D, and then we can iterate and innovate faster. We have our own test facilities and t test ranges where we can go and perform work, iterate, learn, and uh, iterate, and then field a product very quickly. So we absorb the cost of testing and iterating, not the taxpayer, and then we deliver solutions at a lower cost in much faster delivery times uh, than traditional contractors. So along those lines, we spend 60% of our revenue on R&D, which is highly unusual in this market sector. And then we, uh, we're putting our funding directly into developing all of the advanced technology and avoid lengthy R&D cycles and rapidly deliver off the shelf solutions to the government. So Sam, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, time to market, like Brian mentioned, um, your, your self-funding, there's clearly a paradigm shift that is happening and you guys seem to be leading the way. If you were to try to summarize, why is that important in today's environment? The reason it's important to, is to, in today's environment is because the threats evolve very mm -hmm. rapidly today. We must be able to update our products to maintain relevance. The traditional approach takes just way too long. By the time something's fielded, it's already obsolete. So what we're trying to do is to, to the, get our products out much faster and iterate on them and keep them relevant. What that requires is advanced technology, what we call it is hardware enabled, software defined. And we leverage a lot of COTS components that allow us to provide those solutions at a cheaper price. However, we can leverage the economy of scale of commercial technology instead of developing bespoke components like what is traditionally done. And also our adversaries aren't waiting on us, right? So it's imperative that we develop and deploy new capabilities. It's yeah, no, that's that's really interesting because one of the things that Carl and I talk about is that, you know, the technologies that are being used out there by adversaries um, is commercial, right? And so, you know, we're de historically we're developing these exquisite systems that um, are billions of dollars. And yet there's cell phone technology and, um, you know, and uh technologies for automotive radar and and applications like this that are very, very low cost and high volume. And, and adversaries are starting to build uh, systems using the technologies. And so there's this balance of uh, imbalance and costs on our solutions compared to what we're up against. Absolutely. And so what this approach allows us to do is gain an asymmetric advantage with affordable mass. So Andrel advocates for an affordable mass approach to push the U.S. away from highly designed exquisite systems to focus on deploying large numbers of cost-effective defense assets to enhance military capabilities and deterrence. Yeah, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. That, that answers one of the initial key things you said. I, I want to understand a little bit about, you know, what does it mean to be software-driven and, um, you know, can you explain how that differentiates is different from the past hundred years of defense systems and, and why, why is software first and AI first? How does that change things? So software allows you to iterate very, very quickly. And so we use a similar model to what, say, Tesla does. They design a system that's very hard, hardware capable. For example, when when I purchased my Tesla, I had a bunch of cameras around around the vehicle uh, that weren't activated. And then I went to sleep one day, woke up in the morning, and now when I'm driving down the road, when I turn on my turn signal, I had a camera that lit up my blind spot. So that is, is exactly the approach we're taking. We take the most advanced hardware possible, we put it into a hardware package, using COT solutions, and then we deploy those with an MVP, minimum viable product, 
and then iterate on that with software. So the way that Tesla was able to do that was they had they had the camera, they had the heads up display, they have a GPU where they did video compression algorithms, they had the turn signal, they had to integrate all that stuff together in order to provide that view. And so that's the exact same approach that we take, deploy hardware quickly, iterate on features using software and software integration. And that's how you the government can continue to get best bang for the buck for their um, capabilities. So Sam, I, you know, I've been hearing from you and your team, this capability to where you're out, out in the field doing some testing, getting real time feedback. And with that feedback going back and you're actually making modifications that you can demonstrate the next morning. Is that true? We actually ha have a term for that. We call that hotel lab. <laughs> and we, <laughs> so uh, while we're interacting with our customers, we get great feedback and we go back to our hotel lab and then we iterate on exactly what they told us using software, right? That's the power of software. Some of the enabling software features that we use is, is AI. And AI allows us to take repetitive, dull things and then turn them into something that the UI, the AI could do, and they can do it for us at the edge and only alert the user if there's something for them to pay attention to. Very similar to the door, a doorbell at your house. So your, a doorbell at your house will constantly scan the environment and then they, they were, will alert you if there's a package there right? Same concept of someone standing in front of their door waiting for a package versus being mm. alerted that a package was delivered. That's the same concept that we employ for AI. Well, I mean, what, one other thing I wanted to add to that, Sam, is when you look at the more traditional primes that we all know um, and, and kind of the process and the journey they go through from concept to delivering a final product out into the field, um, the paradigm shift we talked about earlier, how long does it take to deliver solutions compared to what traditionally has taken place? And, and I, I, I want to frame that in the context of programs like Replicator, where, you know, everything is like, hey, let's get this stuff out and let, let's get it out so that people can try it sooner than later. So what does that timeline look like? We've taken a process that it typically takes years and turned it into months. The way that you deliver solutions quickly is by owning the product. So you can move at the pace of commercial tech. So we avoid the traditional process that takes a tremendous amount of time. Then we use strong hardware baseline and don't need to build from scratch to address an entirely new mission. So we turn hardware problems into software problems. Um, I can give you an example of the system that we developed here called Pulsar, which is an RF system that does both spectrum sensing and uh, spectrum denial. The Pulsar system was designed in a period of three months. And two months after that, we were already in the field testing. That same process would take many, many years in the traditional acquisition process. And the reason we were able to do that is we went and tried and understood what is the capability gap that our customer has. Well, their 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 gap is there's a lot of spectrum and they're unable to um, process the entire spectrum. And we so we used AI and RF machine learning and and chipsets like from ADI that are able to test this massive spectrum, and then process them at the edge and then put that technology together between ADI's chipsets, software-defined radios, and GPUs in order to create a mission set in a very quick timeline. And then as the commercial market up upgrades their hardware, we're able to take their new hardware and with our open interfaces and then put it back into the system so that we can constantly have fresh and new hardware and then spend a lot of our time just developing software and mission capabilities. Another example is uh, that for that same Pulsar system, we were tasked to build a very challenging CONOP and we were able to start from nothing to completely fielded within an eight month timeline. That's 
traditionally just completely unheard of in the in the traditional defense uh, and prime market. That's really interesting. And, um, you know, you, you, you've taken this software first approach and you, and you certainly, um, certainly need to understand the customer's challenges as well. So it sounds like you've got software experts, you've got systems experts. What are, what are the other kinds of skill sets that, that you have internally and what are the kinds of things that you partner outside? So we think of ourselves as a next generation prime that's trying to do it in a different way. And so we we end up hiring um, many, many engineering disciplines, all of the ones that you would typically see in a in a DOD contractor role, right? Uh, electrical, mechanical, software, UI, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning skill sets. The, what's different, I think, about what we do is we we use a lot of folks uh, coming out of like financial institutions, like cryptocurrency from from Silicon Valley, and then we pair them with people that have a lot of DoD experience, and then have them develop kind of a commercial DoD type uh, of of uh, products, so that we can move at the much faster pace. That's really interesting. So you're bringing in skill sets from these other markets as much about culture as you are about technical capability. Do I, is that part of it? Yeah, that's correct. So even today, uh, Andrew still feels like a, like a startup in the way that we operate and um, communicate. We are much closer to a Silicon Valley technology company than we are to a DOD prime. So I'm yeah. curious, Sam, do you see that as, how does that play into the typical culture when you're in this industry? And what do you see as, as the benefits of it, whether it be more free or thinking or perhaps more out of the box kind of approaches to, uh, to challenges? Yeah, that's right. By having diversity in our workforce, uh, we're able to bring a lot of different ideas uh, to the problem set. We also don't build to requirements, right? Um, we we build to the mission. And so we take a lot of creativity in how we develop our solution. In, in the traditional approach, you're given requirements that tell you, you must do this, you shall do this, you shall do that. These are requirements. And, and what that does is it boxes your solution. It's not not rare it's actually often the case that if there are three vendors competing for a project with the same requirements they have the exact same solution so the traditional acquisition approach does not lend itself to creativity right if, but if you understood what the end mission was hey i want to get from point a to point b then you can design something that does point a to point b instead of telling you build this type of car or build this type of truck it's got to look like this. It's got to weigh this much, right? So tell us what the con op is to A to B in X, Y, Z time. And then we can be creative in how we develop the solutions. So that brings a whole different level of user intimacy, I would imagine, because of the way that you're speaking with them and way that you're presenting your ideas to the missions that they're facing. Yeah, we, we definitely do that quite a bit with things like UI, for example, because a UI requires user feedback. So we iterate on that type of technology on a regular basis. We have working sessions with our, with our customers. We take input from all of our deployments, uh, all of our field test events, all of our demos, and we incorporate that into our final product. Well, that's really interesting. I mean, you, you, you've, um, you brought the, uh, everything to this conversation that we hoped you would. Uh, you know, the Anduril story is a really interesting story, and it's going to be interesting to see how the defense industry uh, changes in the years going forward. You certainly have shown success uh, very, very quickly, not with just small research prog programs, but with real significant program wins. And so um, how do you see this playing out? 
in the next three to five to ten years? How, you you got a you got a crystal ball. We like to um we like to quote on this program. We like to quote the Jetsons. The Jetsons are very good at predicting what the future is going to look like. What what do you think, Sam? I think Andrew is, is a trailblazer, right? It's hard to change people's minds unless you show them. Uh, the way Tesla demonstrated the electric car advantage was was by developing and showing people what it's capable of doing in order to change their mind from what they already knew, which was the gas engine vehicle. So it, what Andrew is doing is we are literally showing Defense Primes and the DOD at large a new business model that works that they can also adopt in order to change the speed at which products and missions can be fulfilled. So we we focus a lot on scale, networkability, interoperability, right? And so all these things together, along with our business model, will f we believe will eventually change the way DOD acquisition happens and also have the primes change the way that they do business as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, Brian, Carl, and Sam, you guys gave a great job of getting insight into this new business model and setting a new paradigm. So we'll look forward to how this works out in the future. We To our audience, uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And you can find more podcasts at podcast.microjournal.com. Thanks for listening. Any?